This is one of the most fundamental questions that people always ask about uh, or need to know about a loudspeaker is, is it going to be loud enough? Um, between this loudspeaker and this loudspeaker, which one gets louder? This is a deceptively difficult question for a loudspeaker manufacturer to answer, uh, primarily because of two reasons. And the two reasons are the word max and the word SPL, because there's not a lot of agreement on either one of those words. Uh, when it comes to max, the answer that people are looking for is, how loud is the speaker when I still like it? It can get to be 130 dB, but you're definitely not going to like it. So how loud is it when I turn it down until I like it again? Problem with that is that that can vary 8 to 12 dB between one person and another. Uh, depending on the style of the music and that person's tastes, a whole range of, of things affect the judgment of when the speaker is out of gas. Uh, SPL is difficult because you think of it as just being a number that you read off a meter. But first off, there are several different varieties of meters. You can have A-weighted, B-weighted, C-weighted, fast, slow. Um, if you remember the, uh, the LAB discussion group, the lab, uh, there was a couple years when there was a gathering in northern Massachusetts uh, with about 50 people. And I did an experiment at one of these gatherings where I set up a speaker and I had smart on the screen with the SPL meter going. And I, I played, I think, uh, three or four different songs and asked people to write down what the SPL of that song was based on looking at the SPL meter. And the numbers they wrote down varied by 12 dB. Turned out some people were just scanning the meter, the, uh, the digital readout, and picking the, the biggest number they saw. Some people were kind of doing a mental average of what's the average number that comes up. And other people were saying, you know, picking a, a low number. There was a huge variation in it, and everybody was looking at the same meter readout. So SPL is not nearly as easy to, uh, to define as it seems when you're dealing with complex signals. Because, of course, which one did I get to? Uh, music is just a horrible test signal, is the problem. Music is very dynamic, continually changing, um, changing in the sense of over five seconds it's changing, over the course of uh, you know, one verse to the next it's changing. So when somebody says, how loud was the concert, you'll hear an audio guy say, oh, it was 103, 104 dB. No idea what that means. Um, because certainly at points in that concert it was 92 dB and at some points it may have been 108 dB. Uh, but still, we, we, we each have our, our means of uh, defining it. So to start out with the, uh, the max part of it, um, loudspeakers are extraordinarily complex when you start trying to define their limitations. There are many different things that are limitations. You can have excursion at the low end. Uh, you can have harshness at the top end of a compression driver. Uh, you could start losing clarity in the mid-range. And each person has a different judgment of which thing is bothering him. The other thing I did at that, at that lab meeting was had people jot down. Uh, oh, another experiment was just to turn it up and have each person say, this is as loud as the speaker gets. Because the next, the next step as we turned it up was too loud for that speaker. And I had him also write down what was it. And we got six different uh, artifacts that define max and, you know, the 12 dB range of when it was too loud. Uh, some people were focused on distortion. Some people were focused on imaging. Uh, some people were just thought, it just doesn't sound as musical anymore. Uh, one guy just wrote it's too loud. So that one's kind of obvious. That's, that's not a speaker characteristic, I wouldn't say. Um, yeah, so which one's going to bother you first? As a manufacturer, I don't know which one's going to bother you first, so how do I put a number on it and say, you can, you can get it this loud, and then you're not going to like the high end anymore? Of course, that depends on the piece of music. That's, that's one that usually gets me, is I don't like uh, compression driver harshness. And of course, a lot of them are gradual, so there's, it's not like 101, it was okay, and 102, it's horrible. It's always, 
it's always kind of a boiled frog situation. So this is what I was talking about. I want to, don't want to read this whole thing, but basically each situation is so different that what acceptable fidelity is, is a difficult thing to define. And the key concept being that max SPL really should be a, a uh, aesthetic judgment. And you can't put aesthetic judgments on a spec sheet and have anybody agree that they're honest. All you can do is do something that's objective and useful in terms of comparing things to each other. And there's, that's what I was looking for is music's a lousy, lousy test signal. So um, this became an especially big problem for us at Fulcrum when we first started because I had a, a loudspeaker that was a low frequency driver and a coax that was passively crossed over. But the low frequency driver and the coax were overlapped from say 40 hertz to 400 hertz and it was biamped. So I could define the max SPL for the woofer, I could define the max SPL for the coax, but then I turned them on together, they summed, and what's the max SPL? The traditional method of specifying max SPL for loudspeakers just didn't apply, and this became very obvious because you also had a version that only had the coax and didn't have the woofer, and by the traditional method, they both had the same maximum output. But of course, we knew that the one with the extra woofer would go 6 dB louder. So we needed a more elaborate means of specifying max SPL. To start out with, um, there's the, uh, oh, this is still on defining it. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is the actual part that I wanted to get to, is frequency aggregation. When you say that a, that a speaker can get to 102 dB, of course the question is, well, at what frequency? And that's how we specify things on a, on a spec sheet. You look it up and say, well, this one is 102, this one, or this one's 102 dB sensitivity, this one's 98 dB sensitivity. But of course that's, at, is it at some frequency? Is it some sort of an average? Uh, a lot of people never actually question it. It's, it's as though it's a, inherent attribute of that loudspeaker, but that number has to come from somewhere. And the, the place that comes from is a concept called frequency aggregation, where traditionally it's, it's uh, equivalent to putting pink noise into the speaker with one watt and just measuring the SPL anechoically, if you have an anechoic chamber, or calculating it if you don't have an anechoic chamber. But it's not very relevant if the speaker isn't flat. You can read these while I'm flipping through them. So the concept of frequency aggregation is that you, you uh, if you're starting from a response as opposed to like an RTA measurement, you can sample the response at various frequencies and you can do a power average of each of those and come up with the total SPL that that speaker is, is putting out. Pink noise gives you essentially the uh, logarithmically spaced power average of the response, meaning the sample points are spaced on logarithmic centers as opposed to, you know, 100 hertz, 101 hertz, it's 100, 125, 160, et cetera. And that correlates you know, much better than, say, white noise to how loud something is. And that's just the equation for calculating uh, RMS voltage. And then, uh, if you're, what you're looking for is the average S or the, the SPL averaged over a frequency range, then it's a similar equation. You just take the average of the squared pressures in that case, and uh, square root gives you the, the uh, average pressure. One of the reasons why this is significant is because the power average of uh, values is much closer to the higher value than it is to the lower value. So what this is telling you is two and eight is 6 dB and 18 dB. The average of those two is not 12 dB. Go through the, the math there, it's actually 15.3 dB. If you did a linear average, two and eight would average to five. If you do a, uh, what I call a Kepstrel average or averaging decibels, it's 12, but 
the one that actually matters is power averaging. This is how it works when you have two uh, musicians on stage. One of them's playing at 98 dB. Second one starts playing at the same level. Now the, the net SPL is 101 dB. If you get to eight musicians, that's two more doublings, so now we're at 107 dB. Now you're going to add a ninth musician. How loud does that guy have to play in order to be balanced with the rest of the band? Well, he doesn't have to play 107 dB. He, he would be 8 dB louder than the rest of the band. He only has to play 98 dB. And the level only goes up to maybe 107.5 or something. That's the way that, that individual sources add. And it's the same with individual frequencies. So when you add one more frequency, it doesn't change the level very much. Yeah, there's the pink noise bit. So here's a, uh, a pretty typical subwoofer. And uh, traditionally, it's been, it's been uh, the, spe the sensitivity is specified by the average within the two points that are the, the band pass of the, of the speaker, which often is defined as 10 dB down from the average. So what you have here is a subwoofer that's 104 dB. But in reality, over the range where you're going to use it, it's uh, well, 100 dB in that case. And this would be a typical 12-inch two-way, which, of course, looks very high. As you can see, that the sensitivity is much closer to the upper range of that uh, response curve than it is to the lower range. Overstates the sensitivity in the way it's going to be used because nobody's going to play this speaker without EQing it. In that case, it doesn't change very much when you take the operating range. So the first step in making something reasonable <coughs> is to use something other than pink noise because pink noise has in the neighborhood of 10 dB more uh, energy at 10 kilohertz than music does. Music is actually surprisingly consistent in terms of uh, like the, the shape of the RTA curve when you're, when you're just uh, playing music across a lot of genres, they all fit fairly closely to this 426B curve, where it starts going down at, at 3 dB per octave at about a kilohertz. Um, Jamie Anderson likes to say that pink noise is every song you've ever heard played at the same time. And that's, I think, a pretty good description. So that's the EQ curve that would be applied to that 12-inch uh, two-way that was, that was up there. So besides uh, weighting the average with pink noise so that it's representative of music, we also need to weight it by the processor response because that's how the speaker is actually going to be used. Now, you read that quickly. That's the, that's the concise definition of what, what we defined as uh, equalized sensitivity. So that you have one weight, one watt of noise going to the speaker, but that's, that uh, noise has been EQ'd so that the speaker's response is flat. And when you do that, on the subwoofer, for example, your, sen your sort of realized sensitivity is actually 98 dB instead of 104, which is much more realistic. Um, in the case of the 12-inch the two-way, you've lost 7 dB off the sensitivity because most of the power is, is going to the speaker below 800 hertz. And with multi-way systems, it's the same concept, except that you add the power to the individual sections. If those add up to one watt, that's the level that you use. And then uh, the SPL from the overall loudspeaker gives you your sensitivity. Uh, this is an example that I was talking about, where the green, green curve is the, the woofer, and the, the brown curve, or black, whatever that is, is the uh, coax which individually are, you know, by the traditional method, are 104 dB and 97 dB. But when you combine them all together, you drive the level up until you have a, a combined power of 1 watt, you end up with 98 dB, which correlates directly to uh, the capability of, of the device. Well, this is an important concept. The, the idea that you can specify a loudspeaker and not specify the processor settings 
It is valid if that loudspeaker is nominally flat out of the box and could be used without a processor. But if there's a processor involved, the sensitivity maximum output of the loudspeaker depends both on the loudspeaker and on the, the processor settings. That's inescapable. So once you've got the uh, equalized uh, sensitivity, of course, it's a, it's a simple step to go to equalize max SPL. You basically turn that up until one of the sections is at its max, uh, maximum power. And the other one may still have farther to go, but it doesn't matter because you don't need it. One of them runs out of gas first. That determines max for that rating. And then, uh, of course, the uh, broadband SPL is the SPL part of max SPL. So some interesting observations using this, this uh, methodology. Um, it's turned out to be really useful in, uh, at design time, designing an, a loudspeaker, and, and you want to know, OK, do I have enough compression driver to keep up with this woofer? Uh, maybe I could actually go to a, a less loud compression driver and still keep up. Those are kind of tricky questions to, to answer. You have to build a prototype and crank it up and just see which one runs out of gas first. And then you have to try changing out one of the drivers to see if you can still get away with it. But this gives you much uh, more actionable information at design time. Um, this is the, the brown is, is uh, RS-426B, which you'll notice the, the, the top of it is at plus 3 dB. That's actually the definition of 426B in that the power average of that averages out to zero dB. And if you do a typical concert um, spectrum, uh, there's 6 dB more level at the low end. I mean, that's an average. People always turn the subs up higher than the mains. And uh, I think of that as being based on the reference of recorded music. When you listen to recorded music in a living room, the, the bass is built up by the adjacent walls more than the mids are. And so that's the same sort of uh, bass run up that you get in a typical listening space, like a living room or a, or a recording studio. And if you want to use CDs to you know, to uh, judge if you've tuned the system well, you want to have the same spectral balance so it sounds normal to you. It's one way to explain it, but the simpler thing is just everybody does this. There are very few events that are, that well, very few rock and roll events anyway where the subs aren't running higher than the mains. Um, so when you use this balance and split it into a, into a typical three-way system, those flat lines are the, are the, uh, the uh, power averaged SPLs for each of those. So let's say call zero 100 dB. So when this speaker system is doing 100 dB, the sub is doing 97 dB, the, uh, the mid range is doing 94 dB, and the high frequency is doing 88 dB. So those levels aggregate to a total signal of 100 dB. This is, it's, it's a tricky thing to get your head around because people are used to thinking that if the speaker system is doing 100 dB, everything's doing 100 dB. It's very analogous to the, the description I gave of the musicians on stage. If the SPL meter say and the band's playing 107 dB and everybody's at the same level, that doesn't mean everybody's playing 107 dB. They're playing 98 dB and the sum of all of those is accumulating to 107 dB. That's the, that's the tricky mental part of the uh, frequency aggregation concept. Two-way split is, is similar. It's just 97 and 96 if you've got a, like a passively crossed over main. So in the end, uh, this, does, this still doesn't give you an indication of how loud can I play this loudspeaker and still like it. All it really gives you is a comparison between loudspeakers, importantly, between loudspeakers of different types. If you're comparing, say, a horn-loaded uh, speaker to a direct radiating speaker, those are so different in, in response and, uh, and the different limitations that it's difficult to, to do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. But this, this technique gives you a, a way to do that. So yeah, it's just the, basically the max SPL tells you how loud you can't take it without undue uh, risk. 
Yeah, I'm going to skip through this stuff. This, this is explaining why the SPL is, is, is also makes it trickier. All oh, right, uh, going back to the um, Crest factor is a very important concept. Um, there's a standard uh, EIA, well, the AES standard specifies a pink noise signal with a 6 dB Crest factor. And it turns out that that's actually not possible. You can make a waveform that has pink spectrum and 6 dB Crest factor, but as soon as you put it through an amplifier, it, it goes almost back to 12 dB. All it takes is a very slight change in the phase response, and those uh, components, those spectral components, combine in a different way. They all they, noise wants to be 12 dB, and if you compress it to 6 dB, all you have to do is put it through the high pass, the 10 hertz high pass in an amplifier, and you're up to 10 dB. If you put it through a processor, you're at 12 dB. So the the most recent. Um, the most recent version of uh, loudspeaker specification standards from AES uh, no longer uses the 6 dB crest factor. I, I wrote up a paper explaining why this is a bad idea. It was a follow on Don Keel had made the same observation. And so now there is no mention of crest factor. People just kind of realize that if, you, if you're going to test a speaker, you need something that will do crests of 12 dB more than, than the power you're testing to. So yeah, the interesting thing is people still, and we still use 6 dB. So when we do a, a max SPL, we'll calculate the max SPL using the equalized SPL uh, methodology. And then for peak SPL, we just add 6 dB to that because it's primarily because it's conventional now. There's a few companies who have started taking liberties and specifying peak SPL as 12 dB above average, which, okay, the speaker can probably do that, but the 6 dB, I, I think, is still more reasonable because very typically people will buy an amplifier that is twice the power of the power rating of the loudspeaker. And the peaks of that amplifier will go another 3 dB on that. So when you do that, what you have is the ability to do peaks that are 6 dB greater than the average. So ironically enough, even though uh, peak SPL is just arbitrarily adding 6 dB to the average max SPL, it's actually a more relevant figure because that correlates to the size of the amplifier you're probably going to use. And if you want to know the average SPL or, you know, the max SPL when you're playing a, a piece of actual music, subtract the crest factor from it. So as a speaker designer, I really can't say you can achieve this max SPL because I don't know what your crest factor is for your music. So, yeah, there you go actually more useful spec than max continuous. So um, one other uh, sort of misunderstanding that this, this technique is really useful for uh, is the effect of EQ on maximum output of a, of a loudspeaker system. Um, I, I, I can't count how many times somebody has said, well, yes, if you put a 6 dB boost anywhere in your, on your loudspeaker, you give up 6 dB of maximum SPL. And that would be true if that loudspeaker was designed. No, it's never true. Um, if you only wanted to play that frequency, let's say you put a, an EQ at 500 hertz and you put a 6 dB boost on it, well, it doesn't change how loud the loudspeaker can get at 500 hertz. It just means you need 6 dB less front end level to get to that level. So the question is, the, the logic is that, well, yeah, but that note is going to run out of gas 6 dB before the other notes, and so we can't get any louder. But you see, you never play a single frequency at full scale. It just, it's, that's not what speakers are for. Um, anybody here want to hear this sound system with a 2 kilohertz full scale sine wave? That's, that's the kind of thing that makes people run screaming from the room. When loudspeakers are played loud, it's always with complex signals. It's when every, every musician on stage is playing at the same time, because if all but one of them stops, that guy can't be playing full level. He's got to be playing 10 dB less than that. So that logic doesn't work out. But there's a couple examples here. If you take this half, half uh, octave cut, the, 
the level averaged with a complex signal only went down by 0.8 dB, even though you, you, you took a 6 dB cut at over a half octave range. And similar, if it's a boost, it only goes up by 1.4 dB. And this is, this is the drive level, not the output, but the drive level to the speaker. Right, so you actually increase the level of the speaker by 0.8 dB and the, and the drive level increased by 1.4 dB. So in fact, the cost of that, of that 6 dB boost was only 6 tenths of a decibel. Not really enough to worry about if your loudspeaker is lacking 6 dB over a half octave. I'd say go ahead and, go ahead and give it to it. Uh, similar with subwoofers, um, when you, an awful lot of pro subwoofers are, are sloping up in the range, in the operating range they're intended to be used over. And people will say, well, if you boost the bottom end, then if you give it 6 dB a boost, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be 6 dB quieter. But the way it works is that, well, here, I did a 4.5 dB boost and only increased the level by 1.5 dB. You put a 3 dB cut at 100 hertz, it went down by 1.5 dB, so the aggregated level's back to zero. So you can play once, so if you, if you turn it down at the upper frequency and up at the lower frequency with a complex signal, the average drive level to that speaker is the same. And if you did that because the speaker needed it, then uh, basically 1 dB less than if you had specified that speaker with the traditional method limited to that bandwidth. So EQ, I guess the message is that EQ is much less expensive than it seems on the surface. You're fixing things that need to be fixed, and the cuts give back part of what you give away with the, uh, with the boost. So here's a, I guess, a brief summary. I managed to get through all the topics. That's great. Um, you can read those yourself, I guess, but the frequency aggregation concept is based on the, the fundamental aspect that speakers are not designed to do one frequency at a time. They're designed for complex signals, but the way we know how to analyze speakers is one frequency at a time. So we'll plot that characteristic against frequency, and in order to connect that, what that means with how the speaker actually performs, you need to have some concept of this frequency aggregation where complex signals are, are using all the frequencies at the same time, and it's the combination of those that tells you what the, what the limitations of the speaker are. Spec sheets can't tell you how a loudspeaker sounds. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty obvious. Um, and the, the whole aspect of, of sort of peeling the onion this deep into this frequency aggregation and how to make a spec that makes sense, the point is that it's actually a very complicated uh, question, and anybody who give, tries to give you a very simple answer is giving you a wrong answer, because the only correct answer is, in fact, complicated. So it pays to, uh, to basically peel the onion and, and kind of wrap your head around the, the aggregation concept. And of course, your ears are the better, a much better measure than anything we can put on a spec sheet. So if you want to look, if you want to determine which of two speakers is going to be louder for a given type of program that you're planning to, to put on, if you can do it, you want to listen to both of them, crank it up and just decide, find out which one and which attribute runs out of gas before the other. And that's, I think, all I've got. I managed to get through it. How about that? That was uh, that was fantastic, David. Thank you so much. So, if there's any questions, I don't know where we are timing-wise, but you know what? Was that that, that's a great idea. Do we have anyone have any questions for David? Um, because we do have just a few moments. Anyone have any? Oh, there's one back here. Let me run back. Apologies for walking uh, Josh in front of the uh, loudspeaker. I didn't think about questions because I didn't expect to finish it all in time. Hey, uh, this is a question about power averaging and and uh, uh, our perception. Uh, does our perception, uh, as in the human auditory brain system, work uh, in a similar way to power averaging? No, actually, there's a slide in there that I must have skipped over without looking up at. 
has a lot more to do with, with peaks because the power average level or the, you know, the long-term average um, is crest factor below peaks. So here's the thing, crest factor is actually a lot less mysterious than it seems. It's partly, uh, I mean, it's genre related, but the, the dominant thing in crest factor is just tempo. You say, what's the SPL of a kick drum? Like, well, okay, I can tell you that the peak is, say, 160 dB. Well, what's the average SPL? Well, you, it's, it's negative infinity for one hit of the kick drum. For an average SPL, you have to hit that kick drum repeatedly. Well, guess what? If you hit the kick drum once every second, and let's say your average is 97, if you hit that kick drum once every half second, it's up to 100. And the peak hasn't changed. And that, that, that concept expands to all the other instruments as well. So when you have these transient events, then that establishes the peaks, but the average depends primarily on the tempo, which is, that was, that was quite a revelation to me when I finally figured that out. So the thing is, if you play twice as fast, it doesn't sound twice as loud, but the SPL goes up 3 dB. So no, uh, the average SPL is, is not loudness. It's much more closely correlated to peaks. Anyone else? Loudness is correlated to tempo. I have now no, known... SPL is correlated SPL to tempo. SPL is, is correlated well, to tempo. Very specifically, crest factor is tightly controlled by tempo. Perfect. And loudness has a lot more to do with, with peak SPL. Okay. There's a mind bender. I've, I've, I've known that now since and actually, I was peak right SP now years old. Yep. <laughs> Peak, peak SPL is actually not a thing because SPL is defined as the RMS average sound pressure. But we kind of, we kind of, you know, say, yeah, okay, whatever. It's, it's to put it on the same scale. You can say, yeah, the peak of the, if you have a hundred dB sine wave, the peak is 103, and we say, yeah, okay, we can live with that. So, fantastic. Um, sometimes the smallest things are make the. Biggest head exploding moments. That yeah. was great. <laughs> um, uh, David, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.